if you're angry, you're probably very right to be angry right now. Just as a little background on anger itself, before we jump into all the reasons why you have to be angry right now, oh, geez, all of them, no, you know what? We're so we don't have this show last all day. We'll stick to reasons related to Corona that you have to be angry. And, and hopefully we can fit that into two hours. We'll see. I, I doubt it. We're going to miss a lot because there's a lot to be angry about right now. Now, emotional freedom, having that maturity to control and, and regulate your emotions as an adult, to, as a conscientious human being, you are going to have emotional responses to things. How you react to the emotional response, the state in which you choose to compose your mind, that's your choice when you have and embrace emotional freedom. And I would never say act in anger. I mean, if you're angry in the moment and you have to mm -mm, self-defense, defend somebody else, jump in a dangerous situation, okay, sometimes acting out of anger will save your life. But when you have the option to step back and act rationally, or from love, that's so much better. Always, 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 if you have that choice. You really have no consequences of taking just a little bit of time to make sure that your motivations and your plans are grounded in reality and principles and positivity, as opposed to negativity or hatred or anger. But right now, this is, there's a, there. For a lot of people who care about freedom, this, this anger, it's like, okay, finally, yes, finally, you see what we've been talking about this whole time, and it's affecting you in a new way. With the coronavirus forced unemployment crisis, because that's what the crisis really is at its heart, the, the, the majority of the, the suffering that we are experiencing right now is not from the virus. I mean, not even close to it, a significant, just barely significant portion of, of everything that, that's tough right now is because of the virus itself. The vast majority of it is because of government's actions using the coronavirus as the excuse. And now, oh gosh, really, it's getting old to say, I told you so. This second wave, this increased level of, of shutdowns, yeah, I knew this was coming. I didn't expect it to be quite this bad. And I, I don't think it's getting worse necessarily the curve of tyranny has more or less flattened but it's still this jagged up down up down because the karens of america are always there to give the politicians the justification the excuse the angry mobs of voters demanding that government protect us from the virus insane so right now, what are we seeing? Our first story today from the Associated Press. States reverse openings require masks amid virus resurgence. Arizona's Republican governor shut down bars, movie theaters, gyms, and water parks Monday. That's yesterday. And leaders in several states ordered residents to wear masks in public in a dramatic force reversal amid an alarming resurgence of coronavirus cases nationwide. It, oh, ugh, alarming? Lots of people who understand basic science, who know how to read, uh, who understand it is so important to be able to read between the lines in a story like this because the propaganda is so it's deeply embedded and entwined in the language. Among those implementing the face covering orders is the city of Jacksonville, Florida, where mask versus President Donald Trump plans to accept the Republican nomination in August. 
Trump has refused to wear a mask during visits to states and businesses that require them. Arizona Governor Doug Ducey's order went into effect immediately and for at least 30 days. Ducey also ordered public schools to delay the start of classes until at least August 17. Most Arizona bars and nightclubs opened after the governor's stay-at-home and business closure orders were allowed to expire in mid-May. <sighs> allowed to expire. When, when they stopped using the threat of government force to keep you from going to your job. Arizona health officials reported 3,858 more confirmed coronavirus cases Sunday, the most reported in a single day in the state so far, and the seventh time in the past 10 days that daily cases surpassed the 3,000 mark. Since the pandemic began, 74,500 cases and 1,588 deaths stemming from the virus have been reported in Arizona. Now, one of the things that I predicted is that as the testing got out and they were able to test more people who end up being completely asymptomatic carriers is in they get it and they don't even notice that they have it or they test for antibodies. And I bet you they're going to say, you know, I mean, and technically the language here is is, is accurate to say if, if you get tested for the antibodies, you test positive for the antibodies and negative for the virus. Remember when I took that little prick test right here live for Adam versus the man, uh, it had two little lines, two reading lines in, in the test. And one is for the active virus and the other one is for antibodies. So if you test positive for antibodies, allegedly, at least if it, you know, and this is a fair assumption, you can't get it again, right? Or you've had and gotten over it or somehow miraculously got a vaccine that doesn't exist, right? Because if you get a vaccine, the way the vaccine works, they give you a piece of the virus that you can create the antibodies without getting sick from the virus. So that if you get exposed to the virus, the antibodies in your system are already there, attack it, and it doesn't affect you. That's the way it, it normally and is supposed to work. So now that we know Trump delayed the testing, there's another wave of testing. coming. Now, whether this is Trump himself or, you know, FDA or Fauci or other manipulators in the system, we know that we were getting testing, test kits out nearly as fast as we know now that we are capable of because of government. The test that I took here was getting out because it was pending FDA approval. They said, oh, yes, any day now you'll be able to sell these online, yada, yada. Nope. Never mind. The FDA just said to the company, can't do it now. So now that the tests are getting out, they say way more cases, but they're not going to point out, oh, by the way, uh, the fatality rate is going down and we're getting to a point of, of herd immunity. And whether or not you believe the concept of herd immunity, which is somehow debated at this point, uh, there is a let the virus run its course strategy. And, you know, there's there's nothing to stop us from doing that anyway. If that's the, the way this is going to go, we're going to get to it's just out there part of the great global family human Petri dish, along with. I don't know, uh, at least dozens, hundreds, thousands of other viruses of similar or much greater virality and mortality. Even. So the state of Arizona is not alone in its reversal. Places such as Texas, Florida, and California are backtracking, closing beaches and bars in some cases amid a resurgence of the virus. And again, it, it might not be a resurgence in the virus at all, just in testing. In New Jersey, Governor Phil Murphy announced Monday that he's postponing the restarting of indoor dining because people have not been wearing face masks or complying with recommendations for social distancing. New Jersey has been slowly reopening and on Monday indoor shopping malls were clear to start business again. Democratic governors in Oregon and Kansas said Monday that they would require people to wear masks. Oregon Governor Kate Brown's order will require people to wear face coverings in indoor public spaces starting Wednesday. Kansas Governor Laura Kelly said she will issue an executive order mandating the use of masks in stores and shops, restaurants, 
and in any situation where social distancing of six feet cannot be maintained, including outside. The order goes into effect Friday. The evidence could not be clear. Wearing a mask is not only safe, but it is necessary to avoid another shutdown, Kelly said. Idaho is moving in a different direction, at least when it comes to the, the elections, despite the continuing spread of the virus. State election officials said Monday that they would allow in-person voting as well as mail-in ballots for August primaries in the November general election. Idaho's May 19th primary was the first statewide election hail, held by mail only. The primary had record voter turnout. And then they have this fancy chart with the global confirmed cases, recovered deaths, you know, and, and who's uh, country by country, you know, doing better or worse. And, you know, no, these numbers are just, we know how manipulated they are. We know how country to country they're using different metrics of, of what counts as a case. So what we're seeing now is this growing anger. You can't plan for things. You know, just uh, you go to a store and it's shut down. You go to the gym. Like even in, in Arizona, here in my home state, the order yesterday, did I get some personal notice? And you know what? They, they freaking violate your privacy with your text messages anyway, at least your default settings. I think there's a way to turn it off. But we get Amber Alerts. And I, this is, I don't mind. This is government doing a good thing, tracking down children who are kidnapped, right? They send you an Amber Alert. You know, sometimes we get storm warnings. I, I generally don't mind these things. I wish there were better systems of doing it, but government is doing good here. Why not tell us what the frick is going on with the shut, just what's the ball? I I don't know. Like right now, what's the policy in Arizona where I live? I don't freaking know. That should piss you off. I mean, just, I, the more I think about it, it's like you know what? I'm re I'm really glad I live where I live because it's it doesn't matter to me. I live on ten acres in the mountains, and I, I have. You know, the garden of freedom here to, to, to do whatever I want with, to set my own rules. You know, I, I go into town. I know the you know, stuff's not going to be open, whatever, wherever I'm going. I check, okay, the post office hasn't been shut down yet, even though that, that might be a carrying vector. Oh, no. Passing the virus around by mail, by contact, touching surfaces. The postal workers here in Ashford wear, wear rubber gloves. Uh, when they're sorting the mail. So I'm not worried about that there. <laughs> but, you know, I I go to the dollar store. I go to, you know, Walmart, Home Depot. They haven't been closed yet. I can call ahead and check. I, I care. I, you know, it's funny about the masks. Like, I wear a mask a lot more than most people do anyway, because I'm doing construction work out here. I wear a bandana, I pull it up over my nose when I'm working with wood, making sawdust or cement powder, right? But, so it's it's natural, it's not a big deal, but I don't know. Could I travel, like, I and I, I'm supposed to be going to the Libertarian National Convention next week. The, and, and even before today's rumor, that it might be canceled, that there's an issue with the venue and uh, because of shutdowns in Florida. You know, even before that, I got I got to drive through through eight states to get there from here. What if one of them locks down or puts up border checkpoints and says, well, yeah, if you're coming from out of state from a hotspot state, and I'm from Arizona now, oh my gosh, now it's our turn to be a hotspot state. Woo! What if you got a quarantine for two weeks? I'm just like locked in a state. Who knows? Florida was doing this before. Texas was doing this before. You got to drive through both states. They were checking for out-of-state license plates and, and mandating quarantines. Now, to what degree they're enforced, I don't know. But if I'm going to be doing public stuff, like, I'm not going to be able to pretend that I'm, you know, adhering to the, whatever they're... They're going to be able to say, ah, you violated quarantine. And now we go to South Beach, msn.com. 
from the Miami Herald not wearing a mask and cost you $50 in South Beach under new COVID crackdown. Like when your only tool is a hammer, every person looks like a nail. Oh, did I say person? Well, I guess when your only tool is a government, every person looks like a potential victim who can be beaten into submission. No positive incentives, positive reinforcement, nothing like that. Just we're going to fine you. If you don't pay the fine, we're going to lock you in a jail where you're definitely going to get corona because there's no social distancing or sanitization in jail. Can't get hand soap half the time. So starting Tuesday, not wearing a mask in South Beach can cost you $50 amid a rising number of COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations in Miami-Dade County. The mayor of Miami Beach announced Monday the city would begin issuing fines to those who ignore rules requiring the use of facial coverings indoors and outside if social distance cannot be observed. The city's new crackdown does not go as far as its neighbors across the bay in the city of Miami, which requires the use of masks at all times in public except for when exercising, eating, or working outdoors or by very young or medically vulnerable groups. You can still walk your dog along the street, for example, but you'll need your mask on if you chat with a neighbor along the way. Violating Miami Beach's rules may earn you a verbal warning and subsequent violations will lead to a $50 fine. That's less than the announced fines in Miami, which start at $50, but can increase to $500 for a third offense. Don't be a repeat offender. Oh my God. This could get ugly. Now, according to the Times of Israel, we have our next fear-mongering story. It's frightening. Doctors say half of cured COVID-19 patients still suffer. Benai Brock woman tells the Times of Israel that a month after testing negative, she has severe fatigue and anxiety, and her husband is worse than when he was hospitalized. Recovered COVID patients are baffling doctors with complaints of freak pains, lungs that just won't get back to normal, and a range of incapacitating psychological issues. Psychological issues. Hmm. Now, what is one of the critical things that makes the coronavirus different from the seasonal flu. You don't have lots of people in positions of authority trying to scare the crap out of you about the seasonal flu. A lot of people just don't know better. They hear these things from the authorities and go, oh, there's a deadly virus. Well, we're shutting down the economy. It better be really freaking deadly. Oh my gosh, they got it. And 99% chance plus you'll be, you you probably won't even notice, or, or what is it, 80% asymptomatic completely? And it could be higher. We won't know until the government finally lets the testing really get out there in a meaningful, accountable way. <laughs> if that ever happens, right? As Professor Gabriel Izbiki of Jerusalem's Shiar Zedek Medical Center told the Times of Israel, more than half the patients weeks after testing positive are still symptomatic. Now, when you have so many people you're counting as cases, then any disease that people get related to this or similar to this or whatever, and, and you can, in, in, in the subsequent weeks, months, you can blame it on coronavirus. And if so many people are getting this, you know, and I'm I'm just I'm not buying the signal, I'm skimming this article. You know, and I'm I'm seeing a lot of anecdotal data. There's there there are there are zero numbers in this story except 50% describing lung capacity. I'm, I'm, I'm double-checking this entire article. 
there's there COVID-19. There's the, the number 19. Her husband, age 55. Other than that, there's not a single number in this article. The fear is turning to anger, especially directed at those who made us afraid for no good reason. And from the Washington Post via cron.com, Elizabeth Chang writes, Americans are living in a big anger incubator. Experts have tips for regulating our rave. Americans are angry. The country erupted into the worst civil unrest in decades after the death of George Floyd. And anger about police violence and the country's legacy of racism is still running high. At the same time, we're dealing with anger provoked by the coronavirus pandemic. Anger at public officials because they've shut down parts of society or anger because they aren't doing enough to curb the virus. And here it, it is sort of legitimate to say things that you could reasonably expect our current government to do, getting out of the way, releasing resources, especially you know the, the major you know military medical resources, uh, supporting research, things like that. You know, yeah, they're not doing that, or, or just making testing available. You know, I, I hate to say this because I don't believe the government should have nearly as much control over the medical industry as it does right now. But as long as it does, and it's to a certain degree uh, the deciding entity here, it should have decided to really support getting more tests out and sharing that data more widely and getting an understanding of this thing a lot faster. Anger about being required to wear a mask or anger toward people who refuse to wear a mask. Anger with anyone who doesn't see things the right way. According to psychiatrist Joshua Morgenstein, the country is now dealing with three disasters superimposed on top of one another. The pandemic, the economic fallout, and civil unrest. Now, I don't think the pandemic is a real disaster. It's a funky off-season flu-like virus with about the same mortality rate. Could be a little bit more, could be a little bit less. Until the government stops lying about the numbers, we won't know for sure. So it's real it's really the economic fallout and I think this is the I mean yes, this is like what we are experiencing. But the pandemic as a disaster isn't real. That's the hoax. It's not really a disaster. It's a little regular quirk that happens in the global human petri dish. So the economic fallout is the government using that as the excuse for uh, more of the rich get richer and the poor get poor you know, nonsense. And then the civil unrest, I mean, George Floyd, yes, tragic case, police reform, something I've been calling for uh, I don't know, my entire time as an activist, at least, um, because <laughs> activists certainly deal with police. And I, it seems like that's just a distraction, and it's working. Even just seeing it, it's the virus, the economic fallout, and the civil unrest it, it is a distortion of the reality. Morgenstein said, certainly one, of, one way of responding and a common way of responding is anger. Morgenstein chairs the American Psychiatric Association's Committee on the Psychiatric Dimensions of Disaster. Surveys over the past few years suggested that anger had risen in the country even before the 2020 crisis. A Gallup poll conducted in 2018, for example, concluded that American stress, worry, and anger had intensified that year. 22% of Americans had felt anger the previous day, up from 17% the previous year. What does that mean? Um, we're not really good at life right now. We're not. I think we can do better. I think we're uh, maybe not fair to say we're not good at life as Americans, but we haven't been getting much better lately. 
And certainly with allowing the modern American lifestyle to develop as it has, again, why I, I feel that what we're doing homesteading here is so important. This is the most important march for freedom in the world that we're leading out of the cities and into the woods where there's plenty of freedom to go around. But more importantly, building a more conscientious lifestyle from the ground up that doesn't allow you to get sucked into wage slavery, to a grind, a rut, a, a lifestyle of television and microwave dinners and and commutes and and tickets and consumerism stress worry and anger is the result of that perhaps this culminating moment is this coming to a head and popping like a zit and when we get over the fallout from this triple disaster we'll be able to really re-examine our lives i think that's part of what's happening already and that's really a beautiful positive thing that we're experiencing the emergency weekly surveys conducted since April by the Census Bureau and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention didn't ask specifically about anger, but they reveal that many Americans are anxious or depressed, especially Black and Asian Americans in the week following George Floyd's death. Both anxiety and depression can manifest as anger. Anger is also an understandable reaction to the uncertainty inherent in the pandemic and protests, said Larissa Tiedens, a social psychologist and president of Scripps College in California, which, by the way, right next to where I went to college in Claremont. We know that uncertainty is both as a cognitive and emotional state is one that people want to resolve. Anger is one way to do that. By being angry about something, you get to leave your feelings of uncertainty for a while and occupy a space and sensibility of certainty and clarity and confidence. Isn't that interesting as a psychological phenomenon? That it is fear and doubt and uncertainty that if you cannot resolve those, become drivers of anger because anger, like a bad drug, provides temporary relief. Of course, staying in that anger is not healthy, leads to depression, stress, anxiety, chronic health conditions that we know make corona worse. Because your cortisol levels go up, stress hormones, all of these things weaken your immune system. If you don't sleep as much, your immune system suffers. So it becomes a problem, quote, when it is sustained or there are recurrent repetitive bouts of it without use of other positive coping tools. According to Damon Tweedy, an associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Duke University School of Medicine. Unmanaged anger can erupt into aggressive behavior against others, which is of particular concern now. Domestic violence cases have spiked during the pandemic, and experts believe children at home with abusive parents are in increased danger. Anger can also harm our own health by affecting the cardiovascular, neurological, and endocrine systems. Here are strategies to curb anger before it gets to that point. So here's the practical stuff. I love this. One, insulate yourself from anger. The most important lesson concerning anger is con con anger control is not to get angry in the first place, said Novico. He suggests three antidotes to help prevent anger from taking hold. Appreciation, affiliation, and aspiration. I love that. Three A's. Appreciation means paying attention not to what angers you, but to things that contribute to positivity in your life. Affiliation means nurturing our relationships. Aspiration means striving to accomplish things that are bigger than yourself or that serve other people. By em employing these antidotes, he said, we're doing things that insulate us from getting angry about stuff. So I love this. And, you know, the appreciation, paying attention to what angers, not to what angers you, but the things that contribute to positivity in your life. If, if this doesn't come naturally to you, 
And guess what? The answer is really, really simple. Find some kind of daily gratitude practice. And when I felt like I've used this when I felt that I needed to get in touch with that, to be to, to train my brain to be more positivity oriented. Just every day when you wake up, you know, you write down three things you, you're grateful for or looking forward to that day or appreciative of, or at night, you know, you before you go to bed, three things that you enjoy during that day or that you appreciate about life in general, whatever works for you. It's a really simple exercise, you know, like sit-ups or push-ups, just training your brain to stay in that positive space, to not let that negativity take over. Another way to insulate yourself from anger is through basic self-care, said Morgan Steen. Getting enough sleep, hydration, and nutritious food and exercise, not using alcohol, tobacco, or other substances to cope. He acknowledges this is hardly earth-shattering advice. There's nothing exciting or headline-grabbing, frankly, about self-care. The things that are the root of our wellness tend to be relatively um, drum. Well, you can make them interesting, but yeah, this is it. And how many Americans screw up or just compromise their sleep and just lower their health a few degrees because, well, I'm just, I got to stay up for this, for my kids, and then I got to get up to get them ready or to go to work or to make my commute. And it, it's just, they build these routines, so many Americans, into their grinds, their daily plan just to, to reduce their health. And it's like, no, this is a really important time to remind yourself and others, hey, how'd you sleep last night? You doing all right? Basic self-care. Focus on yourself. Hey, especially if you're out of work, you got no excuse. Take the time. You know, develop your routine, develop your self-care till you get to that point where you're satisfied with it. But they can be protective. To illustrate the importance of nutrition, for example, Brad Bushman, a professor in Ohio State University School of Communication and an aggression and violence researcher, cites research that found that married people who had less glucose in their blood stabbed voodoo dolls representing their spouse more times than those who had more glucose in their blood. We need our brains to help us combat anger because that takes a lot of cognitive effort. And so we need to feed our brain healthy foods so that it can combat anger. And oh my gosh, don't get me started on the typical American diet and corn syrup and political subsidies and all of that. I'll just say again, this is a time to be more conscientious about this. And especially with so many Americans relying on food banks, you got to be careful. Stock up on vitamins. Get you know a basic multivitamin goes a long way in this. I'm a bit of a vitamin junkie. I have I take a lot in really low low doses, um, and I don't I take vitamins twice a day. I have them all in a pill box, and I lay them out a month's worth at a time. So it, it doesn't take me that much time to be a pill junkie that way. But yeah, you got to supplement your diet and be conscious about the balance of it, making sure that you're getting a complete amino acid profile and 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 a uh, a good variety. I, I mean, a complete, uh, you know, uh, RDAs recommended daily allowances by government numbers, no, whatever it is, but minerals, uh, you know, vitamins, all, all the micronutrients in your food that are often either, you know, processed out, bleached out or GMO'd out, or just, you know, by a, a variety of inorganic farming practices, you know, we, we end up with uh, very low nutritionally dense food, even when you buy from the grocery store uh, produce, it's not as good as it could be for nutritional quality. So the next thing, limit media exposure. We also need to be aware of what we're feeding our minds. Morgan Stein, quote, we, we all have to be very cautious with our exposures to the media. There's so much stimulation and so much information, and much of it is not good news. Studies have suggested a link between viewing television after natural disasters or terrorist events and post-traumatic stress symptoms. Yeah. We really could all stand more media breaks, more time walking outside, seeing our neighbors, saying hello, exchanging problem solving, and reminding each other that we're in this together, Morganstein said. At a loss for words, if a neighbor confides in you, quote, 
you can say to somebody, I don't know what to say right now, but I'm glad you're sharing it. Be counsel. Speaking by phone, Tweety advised setting limits on being intentional about your media consumption. For example, you could set a timer to watch TV or scroll through Twitter for 15 minutes once or twice a day. Otherwise, you could go down a rabbit hole of being on these things for hours without a purpose in mind. And often you wind up feeling worse than when you started. Remember, there's a term for this now. It's called doom scrolling. We covered that a couple weeks ago. The next part, watch for signs. To control it, and this isn't signs, signs everywhere, there's signs. No, watch for signals. To control your anger, Novico said, you've got to recognize that it's happening. That means self-monitoring, being attuned to the physical feeling, a flushed face, a racing heart, or tight muscles, perhaps, that indicate anger is approaching. So there, there's a lot of stuff that we can do in, in our own self-awareness. And, you know, I don't, I, I, it's, it's funny coming from me and all these things because I've never really had any kind of anger issues. I, you know, I've, I've, from childhood, I, I, I used to say that, like, I don't even experience anger. You know, I'm, I'm able to stay in touch with, with love for other human beings. I get angry at the world. I get angry at government. I get angry at the news. I get angry at politics. And I do limit myself. You know, and 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 for me, the signs are more like I, I'm I'm getting wound up in thought patterns, thought loops, things repeating themselves. And I I don't do the doom scrolling, but I'll I'll catch myself like obsessively researching something without a point. And going, well, gee, this isn't really satisfying. It's not really productive. Why am I doing this? You know, and I'll catch myself. So we sense when we sense those feelings, we said we shouldn't try to suppress or deny them. Quote, I think it's important for people when you talk about anxiety or anger to sort of acknowledge that it's there. Oh, yes, I'm anxious right now. And that's OK. He suggests allowing yourself to feel that way for a short period of time and then moving on to either address your anger in a constructive way or engage in self-care. Next, stop and think. If you feel an impulse coming on to do something antagonistic, Novico said, you've got to think, wait a minute, is this a good idea? What are the consequences of this? How is this helpful? As Novico points out, Americans' threat perception might be off kilter at this moment in time, given the virus and the unrest in the country. We might need to remind ourselves, he said, that we've got a problem here that needs to be solved, not a threat that calls for an attack. Bushman said that another reframing strategy that works is to adopt a fly-on-the-wall perspective. Look at things from a third-person perspective rather than being immersed in the situation. Next, deal with that heightened energy. Addressing our anger involves both physiological and cognitive components, according to Bushman. Psychologically, you want to reduce the arousal state to get rid of the anger, he said, through taking deep breaths or listening to calming music or counting to 10 or following Thomas Jefferson's Council 100. Uh, when your breathing is slow and regular, you're not angry and you're not anxious, Novico said. What you shouldn't do, Bushman added, is vent. So this is really important because a lot of people think that venting is helpful in dealing with anger because it's like like that bad drug. It's that coping mechanism. It's, it's coping with the uncertainty associated with whatever is making you angry. And there always is. I mean, I can't imagine being angry and being certain about things, right? Obviously, there's some uncertainty involved in, in every kind of anger. And be, uh, letting yourself be angry and vent relieves that. It, it, it's a drug, though. It's, it's a bad drug that makes the problem worse. What it gives you is this momentary hit, this feeling of certainty. And so as Bushman said, when you hit, kick, swear, scream, shout, punch a pillow, punch a punching bag, what you're doing is keeping the arousal levels high. Yeah, so you are priming yourself for more anger. Jeez. Sounds like a town hall. Yeah, there's a reason in, in, in times like this, too. You see a lot of members of Congress like we had, you know, in the economic crisis, like we had around the Tea Party, you know, and all these different 
you know, periods, oh, the congressional town halls are a big deal now. Everybody's showing up to, uh, to hear from and, and, and give their congressmen a piece of their mind, right? And it's they're stoking that anger because it makes you vulnerable. It makes you very easy to manipulate. Man, I just keep loving that John Lennon quote. They will do everything to me. I, I almost, I, I feel like I got to pull this up to do it justice. But, you know, it's, it's the, the gist of it is, you know, that they will do everything they can to make you angry. They will flick your nose and pull your beard. Because anger and violence, that's their game. They know how to deal with that, and they will beat you with that game every time. What they can't handle is humor and laughter and love. And that's what this is all blocking us from, is getting in touch with love and living happy lives and being able to just be able to laugh through life and enjoy it. So next, distract yourself. You can also address the cognitive aspect of anger. Bushman said, angry people tend to ruminate about what made them angry. They just mull it over and over in their minds. And that just makes things worse. So if you can, distract yourself. He suggests try doing something that is incompatible with anger and aggression. And I love this. This could be petting a puppy. Hugging or kissing a loved one or helping somebody in need. And so obviously you got to have your own thing for this, right? For some people, it's it's a mindless game on your phone, right? You feel yourself in a thought loop and you're just like, you know what? A couple times a day, um, well, geez, I don't want to even name it. I, I play words with friends with my family and I, I like staying in touch. So yeah, I check in on words with friends a couple times a day. And it guarantees that I get a complete like mental break from whatever thought loops might be developing in my mind. Puppy, petting a puppy, it's great. We have puppies. It's, it's like, can you be angry while petting a puppy? No, you can't. You can try it. Try, I dare you. Show me a video, internet. It's not possible. An angry person petting a puppy. No, can't happen, right? Poor kitten. Hugging or kissing a loved one. And again, in relationships, this is why it's so important to be able to turn to a partner instead of turning away from them with that anger, letting that anger, instead of being a barrier, letting your 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 loved one be that uh, that that distraction. I hate to say distraction, but that 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 break in your experience of anger. And here it's even more powerful. It's not just oh, it, it's it's a puppy. I have to like love a puppy. It's 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 you know loving and connecting in in, in a direct way. And that really you can't. I mean. You you can't you can't cuddle angry. I'm so angry. I'm gonna cuddle you. No, like just obviously incompatible activities. Helping someone has the added benefit of giving you a sense of control. As Morganstein said, one of the things that can feel very overwhelming and paralyzing for people is to sit in a passive mode, especially when absorbing news or social media. Helping another person reminds us that we are not helpless. We are not powerless, and there are things we can do to affect change. Next, take action. As several of these experts pointed out, anger isn't necessarily a bad thing. Most people call it a negative emotion, but virtually every movement in history has been fueled by anger because angry people want to do something about their current situation. Now, this is like, you know, really interesting because it's not just at the social level, but the personal level, too. You might find that whatever makes you personally angry, be it a social thing or something about your past, some trauma, some abuse that you've experienced, some, you know, resentment that you have towards your parents, perhaps. You know, and if you've, if you've experienced abuse as a child, there's a lot of desire for revenge when you, when you grow up and realize what happened. But as my mom always told me, the best revenge is living well. And that's so important in this, too, is that, you know, like at the social level, as Buckminster Fuller said, you don't defeat the old system by fighting it, but by building the new system that renders it obsolete. And how, how much more positive is that than like what we're doing again with the garden, you know, building your own life and saying, I'm going to be conscientious about everything from the ground up and I'll eventually declare independence. And all right, we got the we got the actual quote. When it gets down to to having to use violence, then you are playing the system's game. The establishment will irritate you, pull your beard, flick your face to make you fight because 
once they've got you violent and they know how to handle you, the only thing they don't know how to handle is nonviolence and humor. Thank you, CJ. Now the segment is perfect with that quote. I love it. Yes, appropriate respect for the wisdom of John Lennon. So as Novico said, in contrast to other emotions such as depression and anxiety, anger can be a powerful positive force. Anger doesn't stop you. The important thing, though, is to use it in a way that has a positive result. And Tiden says that's happening with students who, instead of wallowing in anger, are engaging in activism. As she said, I think that is a great way of dealing with anger. And I couldn't agree with her more. Finally, consider your children. Remember that your children are watching how you are dealing with anger. Tweety said, I think it's important to be open about these sorts of things because kids are going to feel emotions as well and have to learn how to deal with it as well. Morgan Scene agreed. If we are feeling really angry, showing our children and helping explain to them why we're doing what we're doing can be an amazing opportunity to model something. And in the era of Rona rage, this is the opportunity for America to channel that anger and model something for the world as we once did with the American Revolution. Perhaps it's time for another and a surge in motivation and conscious, conscientiousness from the Rona raid may be the catalyst. And today is Tuesday, June 30th, 2020. Thank you so much for joining us on Adam vs. the Man and sticking with us through that very long opener. I hope that was very fun and practical. Joining us from Phoenix today, appearing on that side of the screen, is comment Jim Freedom. Yeah. Uh, was hey, that, hey. Jim, I, I hope that was worthwhile. Was that was that a good segment? How uh, was it was a comment? great segment, man. I was good yeah. to my seat the whole time. I mean, I always am anyway because I work here, but. <laughs> so. yeah, uh, any like good that. comments? People appreciating a little practical perspective synthesis on the news combined with some useful advice, I would hope. Yeah, yeah, they were all kind of uh, participating with you on, on your anxiety and emotion speech right there. Like Ride With Me 38 was saying, anger is a non-productive emotion. It blocks you from moving forward and being proactive and finding a solution to the problems that caused the anger in the first place. Yeah, it certainly can. It can, And, and it's, a, it's a bit of a complex, you know, emotion and being applied that way because it's, if you know the solution... Anger can motivate you to grab it when you weren't motivated by by it, you know, before, right? But you can't it can't help you see the solution. You know, you're never gonna be right. better at understanding re you might be more I mean, really, that's the only positive thing about anger is, is motivation, right? Motivation to act. But to you still have to have clarity with that action, and anger will never increase your clarity by itself. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what Jeremy Gooding said also. He was responding to somebody else, but he was saying fear is more like a vehicle. Fear can be a good thing that keeps us on guard or it can be weaponized. And the virus is just one of many rounds in this clip. Yeah. Yeah, so it's sort of, you know, it's, it, it, fear and anger as opposed to depression and anxiety, right? Whereas like depression and, you know, depression just, not being in a good mood for an extended period. I mean, yeah, I know there's way more to it than that. I dealt with it myself as a teenager, typically, right? And, uh, you know, the there's there's no, like, upside to depression, right? There, you know, there's no, to, and anxiety, like, just worrying, going over stuff in your head over and over. There's no, there's no upside. But both fear and anger are things that are programmed into us for good reason, right? right? And they, they they have to be, you know, understood. Again, you can have that response. You can have that thought. You can have that underlying feeling. But emotional freedom means you never stay in that headspace. You're able to break out of it and say, 
okay, I'm afraid of that. Oh, well, that's scared. All right, so now I'm going to step back and conscientiously examine what made me afraid and how to deal with it rationally. You know, and, and, and it's, you know, if, if you let that get carried away, it turns into anxiety, depression, and, and these negative emotions and, and states with no upside. 